Welcome to Love Unlimited Church Online. My name is Mark Rodriguez. I am the pastor of the church. And today we're starting a brand new series called Runaway on the book of Jonah. You're going to love the message. You pretty much know the story of Jonah. A lot of people do. The story of a guy who doesn't do what God wants him to do. God puts him in the belly of a big whale. He lights a candle and the whale throws him up on the shore. And he gets to be a real big boy for the rest of his life. Okay, that's not the story of Jonah. That's the story of Pinocchio. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the story that a lot of people consider to be a kid's story that you hear about in Sunday school. But the truth is that the story of this reluctant prophet Jonah really will speak into our lives if we listen to the Spirit of God. So let's start today in Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and I will set the context for us. And here's what the Bible says. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. And this is what God said. God said, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. In verse three, though, we see Jonah's unfortunate response. Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish. And, and what is it that he did? He sailed. He ran from God. He was a runaway. And let's look at the meaning behind a few of the words that we're going to be using today. The first one is Jonah. He's called by many the reluctant prophet. See, a lot of us read this and uh, we've heard the story before and we're like, what's the big deal with Jonah? Just go to Nineveh. What is the big deal with Nineveh? See, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Nineveh was Israel's absolute and foremost worst enemy. Israel hated the Ninevites. And you'll see why as we actually go into uh, our study. Let's look at verse 1 again. And as we do, and as we start to look at the story, I believe that God may show you what he showed me, that all of us have a little bit of Jonah in us. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1. The Bible says the word of the Lord. Say this out loud with me wherever you are, wherever you're watching. All right, Jonah 1 1. It's on the screen. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. The good news is this, that the word of the Lord is going to come to you to today. God is a God who loves to speak. See, wherever God creates he speaks. When God created the world, he spoke. He said, let there be light. And there was light. He created with the spoken word. John 1, 1 says this, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, God is a speaking God. God created Adam and Eve because he wanted to love and he wanted to be loved. He wanted to speak. He spoke with Adam and Eve in the cool of day in the garden. And he is a God that speaks throughout history. God speaks in different ways. God has often spoken in an audible voice. God has spoken through his prophets. God has spoken through circumstance. God has spoken through the voice of the Holy Spirit. If you've never heard the voice of God, you can and will today, if you would simply open yourself up to his word, the Bible. It is described as living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. This is his word that pierces his truth. It is living. It will transform you. The word of the Lord will come to you and God will speak to you and to some of you in a very specific way. See, his word will be the change that some of us need to move into a new direction, to be obedient to what he says. And you will have a choice when God speaks to you. You can do what he wants you to do. You could be obedient to his will or you can do what Jonah did and say, God, I do not want to obey your will. See, the word of the Lord, the will of God will come to you. That's the good news. The challenging news for all of us, for many people, and if you're taking note, it's the first thought today, it's the first point in our outline, that God's will many times isn't my will. See, when God comes to you, he will often ask you to do things that you don't want to do. 
And the reason we don't want to do them is because a lot of times we think that we know what's best. We try to convince ourselves that we really know what is better for us. See, I could sit here for days and tell you hundreds of stories of times that I have done that. See, a lot of times we feel like we know what's best for us and we don't want to obey the word of God when it comes to us. And this is what Jonah did. Look at verse 2. God says to him, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because wickedness has come before me. See, you might be wondering, well, okay, Jonah is a prophet. And that is what prophets do. They, They preach the word of God. He preaches. And why didn't he just obey God's assignment? Well, when you understand the history of Nineveh or of Syrian Empire, you will understand a little bit more why he hated them. You see, uh, and and I'm going to warn you, this is like PG-13 historical stuff, all right? So uh, you may want to cover your miners' ears right now. Nothing too crazy, but just the way that the Ninevites treated people, all right? This is what they did. Nineveh was the capital city of Syria, all right? And it was rumored that whenever the Assyrians would attack someone, they were so brutal in the way that they would handle the captives that they would torture them, and and they were so destructive that occasionally... It was rumored that when the Assyrians said that they were going to attack a town, the people would just commit suicide because they would rather die that way than experience the wrath of their empire. All right. They were hated. You could read this in history books. This is what they would do. They would go in and they would take over a city and they would kill all sorts of people. Then the surviving women would be abused and killed. They would torture kids. They would take the husbands then, all right, the prisoners of war. And they would take them outside the city. They would skin them alive. And then once they were skinned, they would bury them in the desert. Can you just imagine the pain that they were going through? With sand up to their necks, all right? And then they would take their tongues and pull their tongues out. And they would drive a stake through their tongues so that they would go crazy as they were dying of thirst in the middle of the desert. Okay, that's the end of my explanation. But now I just want you to imagine God coming to his prophet that he loves, all right? Jonah actually, it means dove. It means humble. It means sweet. That's what his name meant. And so there's this sweet, humble prophet and God comes to him and says, go and speak and preach to these barbarians. I want to save them, all right? These guys were so bad. They were so bad that when you would go to a city, that they had conquered the head, the skulls of the dead people would be set up like a pyramid in front of the city so that you can see and know that the people of Nineveh had been there. All right. So now you know why Jonah had so little mercy for them. I don't want to go there. I hate these people. See, the word of the Lord will come to you sometimes and you will hear specifically from God. And this is what I want you to do. This is what God is saying to you in your mind. And you may think, okay, I understand that. But why do you want me to do that? I don't want to do it, God. I hear you, but I don't want to do it. I don't want to have anything to do with this family member. Perhaps you can relate in different ways. Maybe maybe someone in your family has hurt you or hurt someone that you love. And the word of the Lord comes to you and the word of the Lord tells you, forgive them to forgive as you have been forgiven. And you look and you go, I don't want to. They they don't deserve it. I don't feel like forgiving them. I I know that's that's what God wants me to do, but I don't want to do it. And I know that a lot of you have heard this teaching of of tithing, the biblical tithe. and, And scripture's crystal clear that God trusts us to manage his resources And 10%, the first 10% of what he trusts us with belongs to him. And we don't want to do it. We don't want to obey it. We don't want to return the tithe as an act of worship. And a lot of you have heard that you're like, I I, I don't want to do that. I know that's what God said, but I don't want to do it because in my mind, it doesn't make any sense. I like my things more than I want to obey God. I simply don't want to do it. Maybe you're dating someone. And he, he's just so cute or she smells so good. Unlike your other friends, you know, and you get and, and you get close to this person and, and you get these fuzzy feelings when you're around them. You know what I'm talking about? 
You know, you just you just can't stop thinking about them. You can't stop texting them. You can't stop liking their pictures online. You're like, oh my God, she's just so fine. All right, he's just so hot. Or maybe you're like the song, oh my God, look at her butt. And the next thing you know, you've been doing stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. You've been messing around. The word of the Lord has come to you that this is for marriage. It's not for dating. And you've got a choice. And a lot of people will say, well, I know that that's what God says, but I want to do this. I don't care what God says. God's going to forgive me later. I want to do this now. It feels good. It, make me, it makes me feel loved. You don't care what God says. And that's the Jonah in all of us. Maybe the word of the Lord has come to you and you've thought, okay, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I want to do it my way. Uh, I'll obey God later. I'll do it later. I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. Remember this, delayed obedience is disobedience. I'll say that again. Delayed obedience is disobedience. It's kind of like a parenting technique of teaching your kids, you know, do this, do this. Come on now, do it. Don't, don't make me count over there. I told you to do this. I'm serious now. Listen to me. I'm going to break something over your head. Listen to me. And we never do anything that we're telling them to do. And you're like, okay, I'm going to count to three. Okay, one, two, two and a half. Okay. And, and that's what we're doing. You know what we're doing? We're teaching delayed obedience. We're telling our kids, don't run into the street. Don't run into the street. One, two, and splat. And, and it's over. Delayed obedience is disobedience. You know what? The mark of maturity is lag time. You can tell the maturity of a person between the distance of the command of God and when they choose to obey. See, if the distance is short, then they're mature. If the distance is long, it's immaturity. You know what freaks me out sometimes? Is that Love Unlimited would be known as a group of people where there's a lot of lag time if we obey at all. See, God commands us to do things and, and many times we are guilty of saying, I don't want to do it. It's not convenient. I don't want to do it now. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. You see, the word of the Lord will come to you. And many times his will will not be your will. And you will say, I don't want to. See, many of our desperate prayers, and I want you to think about this right now. Many of our desperate prayers are the outcome of moments when we said, God, I don't want to do this. Stop and think about it for a second. What are some of the prayers? And I'm not saying don't pray, but if we stop and we look Many of the things that we're suffering and desperate about are moments in our life when we decided not to obey God, all right? And, and you're like, well, but I, I, I didn't know what to do. See, sometimes you're not going to hear the, the voice of God. Hey, Mark, do this, right? You're not going to hear that. But the Word of God is full of wisdom. The Word of God is full of moments that we can pull from so that we can grow as believers and followers of Jesus. Jonah said, I don't want to go there. I don't want to have anything to do with those people. They make me angry. Remember this, God will speak to you and he may tell you to do something you don't want to do. The second thing is that you can always find a boat sailing in the wrong direction. You see, some of you know what I'm talking about. You say, hey, I want to obey God. I want to do what he's calling me to do. So many of you make decisions to fully surrender your life to God and no later than a couple seconds after you do that, someone will come and say, hey, don't do that. Let's go back to the way that we used to be. Hey, let's go back to the old life. Let, let, let's do this sin. Let's do this bad habit one more time. Watch how it happens here in Jonah. God says, I want you to go preach to the Ninevites. And look what happens. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. And after paying the fare, he, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. See, why did he sail to Tarshish? I can't barely say the word. Why didn't he choose somewhere else? Because he wanted to go as far as he could from the will of God. Tarshish was 25,000 miles away from Nineveh. All right, one Bible commentary said that it would take about a year to sail from where he was to where he was going. That's a lot of running from God. Some of you right now can relate. You may be sitting next to someone who thinks you're absolutely on track. 
all right? But you know it in your heart that you've been running and you're long away from God and the word of God is coming to you. And here he's saying, I want you to do this. And somewhere along the way, months or weeks ago, maybe years ago, you said, no, I, God, I don't want to do what you're asking me to do. God, but, but, but I don't want to obey you and you've been running and you think you can get away with it. You need to understand you could only run for so long. You can't run forever. You cannot run forever. Maybe you're, you're thinking that it'll never catch up, but it will catch up to you. Maybe you're not on the run like Jonah was. Maybe, maybe you're listening to say, say, but I'm not running from God, but you're drifting. You're just drifting. You know what? Last summer, I went on vacation with my wife and my kids and my in-laws and my sister-in-law, and we were staying in this cute little hotel in Sanibel. All right, we had actually never gone to Sanibel. The beach was super nice, super soft sand. My kids love the ocean. I, I want you to know this and frame this, and some of you already know this. My, my kids love the ocean. We've been taking them to the beach since they were real little. One of the main reasons is because the ocean is free, right? If you can find parking, <laughs> it's free. And uh, my two boys love like snorkeling and throwing their football in the water. And, and as soon as we get to the hotel, I mean, like, I'm parking the car and they're like, Bobby, 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 when can we go to the beach? When can we go to the beach? And I'm like, look, we got to unload all this stuff. We got to go into the room. And so finally, we, we get into the room. We're checked into the room. And then the kids are like, all right, let's go to the beach. Let's go to the beach. So we get all our stuff together. And you'd think we'd be moving to the side of the ocean if you see my wife and I and the three kids and all the stuff that we take, all right? And so we finally settled down. I'm thinking, I'm going to take a nap now because I'm tired. I've been driving and these kids are driving me nuts. And then they're like, can we go in? Can we go in? Can we go in? And I'm like, yes, please go in. And so they go into the water. And, and what was weird for us when we got there is that it's super shallow for like a really long way. And they have to actually go really far away to go into water that's just a little deeper so that they can have fun. And so Leilani doesn't want them to go that far, okay, because she's Hispanic and Hispanic women are scared of a lot of things, all right? Um, and, and some of you would say, Mark, but if uh, people knew who you were, they'd understand her better and you're probably right. And so she's like, babe, go in there with them. I'm going to stay here with Stella. And I'm like, okay, there goes my nap. <laughs> so I go into the ocean with the boys and immediately we start having a bunch of fun. I start throwing them and, and then we start throwing the Frisbee around and we're playing around and we're swimming and we're, we're exploring this new beach that we had never been to. And about 15 minutes later, uh, I hear Caleb saying, Papi, look, our, cool our hotel is super cool. It's changing colors. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And, and he's like, yeah, look how cool. And when we came in, it was one color. And now I guess with the sun, it's changed colors. And I'm like, that, that can't be like, no way. And, and, and then I, I keep looking and I realized that we had drifted away like three or four hotels from where we had gone into the water. And I didn't see Stella and Leilani anymore. And we had to swim back against the current. We drifted. See, some of you today can relate to that story because maybe months ago, a, a year ago, you were really close to God. Before the pandemic, you were drawing closer to God and you've drifted away. There were moments where you felt that God was so close to you. You'd read the Bible and boom, the words would fly out of the Bible. You'd go to church and be like, oh my gosh, the message was for me. You'd hear God leading you to do things and you would do them. And you're like, is this a coincidence? And no, it wasn't a coincidence. It's a God thing. God was speaking to you, but now you're wondering, why isn't God speaking to me anymore? Why, why am I not hearing God? And you could trace it back maybe to that day where maybe you skipped church online. Maybe you skipped it and everything was fine and you skipped it again. And then, you know, you put the Bible down because things got busy and things changed and you stopped reading it and you stopped praying as much. And, and you didn't see God and the activities of your life anymore like you did before. And, and you're, you're thinking, but, but I'm not running from God. You're not, but you're drifting from him. See, when we disobey the commands of God intentionally or even unintentionally, we're drifting. We're separating ourselves from him. The Jonah and all of us, see, the word of the Lord will come to you. It may not be what you want to hear. All right. When you run, you could always find a boat that's sailing in the wrong direction. And some of you are running right now. And the third thing is that God sometimes sends a storm to grab your attention. It says that then the word of the Lord sent a great storm on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship 
threaten to break up. <laughs> the ship threatened to break up. See, God may send a storm your way to grab your attention. Some of you might go, oh, 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 I see it. Oh, oh, now I know why this is happening in my life. God sends a storm to grab our attention. Sometimes God allows difficulty in our life to get our attention. In verse 4, Jonah was on the run, the scripture says. The Lord, he sent a great wind and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Now, this was a ship. I want you to picture this, a ship that was transporting cargo full of sailors, which means it's a really strong ship. This was such a great wind that we're talking about here that you could only imagine this, this huge ship going boom and boom and just being tossed around by the wind so that these experienced sailors could be freaking out, okay? It's not the little pictures of the little cute little cartoons in the children's story. See, a storm that these guys had never seen before so much that the integrity of the ship was at risk. They were starting to say, whose fault is this? Why is this happening? And so they drew straws, kind of like a little lottery. And they said, well, Jonah, it's your fault. And they said, who are you? And what did you do to bring this to us? And verse 8 reveals the answer. It says, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. And this terrified them. And they asked, what in the world have you done? Because they knew that he was running from God. All right. The storm blows up. And all of a sudden, he starts to bring up the Lord again. See, maybe we need God. I, I, I worship God. Like many of us, when things start going crazy, we're like, God, where are you? See, if you were to ask me, what are some of the problems in the American church today? I don't know what all of them are. But one of the biggest problems is this, is that we got a generation of people who call themselves followers of Christ, but don't live like it at all. See, there's no distinction between them and the person that lives next door to them that doesn't know Jesus at all. It's cultural Christianity. It is Christianity in name. It is consumeristic religion. It's, well, as long as God does things for me, yeah, uh, I'm like, I'll do the church thing every now and then. I might bless the Thanksgiving meal or something like that. Hopefully, I'll get to heaven one day and I'll also get that promotion at work. And then if I get sick, I'll go to him and I'll ask him to heal me or, or heal someone that I love but there's nothing in my daily life that resembles the teachings of Jesus and Scripture. Just because you're involved in church doesn't mean that you worship God. See, worshiping God is not just something that you do for a few minutes a week. It's a lifestyle. It's worshiping God. And you're probably thinking, oh yeah, but I worship God. I listen to Hillsong on my iPod when I can't sleep. I worship God. Then I go home and I yell and I scream at my kids and I throw things at them. Uh, you worship God is probably what some people are thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I worship God. I, I worship the Lord. And then, then I go play golf and I take God's name in vain. You really think that you worship God? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I'm a Christian. We're a Christian couple. We're, we're a Christian family. We even have our own Bibles that sit on the coffee table. We're Christian. But our marriage, uh, we haven't been getting along and, 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 and you know, we, we don't really like being around each other anymore. We really don't have a, a biblical reason for getting divorced, but, you know, we're just not happy. So we're going to get a divorce and we'll still be friends because that will be better for everyone. I, I know what God says, but, but I don't want to do what he says. See, forgive me if this comes out like a little harsh, but it's just I believe that one day I am going to have to answer to God for the level of what happens in our church, in our lives, in our ministry. And there are times when I look around and I'm like, God, are, are we really drawing closer to you every day? Are we really a people that are pleasing you even when no one is around? I don't, I don't want to be known as a lukewarm movement or church I, I, I don't want to be said, oh, but they're just culturally Christian. Yeah, they, they know what God says, but they only do it sometimes. You say you worship God. Well, let's worship God with everything that we have, not just our words and our songs, but with our actions and the way that we treat each other. It said that the sails were freaking out. It was a big storm and Jonah finally realized it's my fault. See, some of you are going to recognize that right now. You're going to think, well, what I was doing, my, my private rebellion isn't hurting anyone. Oh, don't kid yourself. If it hadn't hurt somebody yet, it's going to hurt them tomorrow. Do you realize that, that the storm that is happening around you is because of your rebellion? 
and now it is affecting your family and the people around you the same way that it was affecting the innocent on that boat that Jonah was on. In verse 12, it says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. The sailor said, I guess what we need to throw you off, bro. And so they, they said, God, forgive us. We're sorry. We don't want to do this to Jonah. And they throw him overboard and the sea goes calm. And then something unbelievably bad happens to Jonah. If you know the story, he got swallowed up by a big fish. People say Jonah got swallowed up by a whale. Well, it's not a whale. Originally, the text says it was a fish. It doesn't really matter. It was big. It was nasty. And he was in the fish for three days. All right. Now I want us to look at our last point, point number four. Sometimes our worst nightmare is exactly what we need. Jonah's worst nightmare was exactly what he needed. Jonah 1.7 says, but the Lord provided a great fish one more time. What did God do? The Lord provided. God is merciful. God still loved Jonah, even though he was running from him, even though he was drifting from him. God still loves you exactly where you are. I know I've said some intense stuff, but God wants to provide a fish for you. All right. And Jonah was inside of that fish for three days and three nights. The Lord provided the fish. And what we see is that the worst possible scenario, the Lord provided the fish. What Jonah would see as the worst possible scenario was God's provision. Some of you right now may be facing what you would consider your nightmare. I mean, financially, you may be like, I'm done. It's over. And God may say, okay, now I have your attention. Some of you may be facing a relationship that you think couldn't get any worse. And then God may say, okay, do I have your attention? Now, I'm not saying that everything that happens in your life that's bad, it's God causing it in your life because I don't believe that that's true. But I do believe with everything that's in me that God may cause or God may allow what we would consider our worst nightmare to happen so that he can get our full attention. So I want to say this to you today. Don't be a runaway. Stop running from God. Stop saying no to the will of God. Stop saying, God, but I don't want to do this. And begin today to trust God. Hey, I hope that this message reminds you that God is a God of mercy. God is a God that forgives. I, I hope that maybe it helped you identify something in your life that you need to shift and stop running from the blessings that God wants to pour upon your life because that's what the will of God is. The Bible calls it the perfect will of God. And so sometimes our life isn't perfect. Sometimes our life is crazy because our life is outside of the will of God. And so today I want to pray for you. Some of you today need to rededicate your life to God because when you run from God, that means that you stop being dedicated to God. And you started being dedicated to other things. And so today, the step you need to take is say, God, I want to rededicate my life to you. Some of you have been running your entire life. And the decision that you need to make is to surrender your life to God for the very first time. And so I want to lead you in a prayer. I want you to bow your heads right now. I want everyone in the room, everyone that's with you. Uh, and maybe you're by yourself. All right, close your eyes and pray this out loud with me. It's your heart to God. And say this, dear God, I come to you today and I say, I'm sorry for running. I'm sorry for drifting. I'm sorry for saying no to your will. I give you my life. I give you everything. Rescue me today. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to take this seriously now. I want you to send me a text with the word amen to 786-541-1020. I want to pray for you. I want to add you to my personal prayer list. And I also want to send you some resources that are going to draw you closer to God. Hey, maybe you're watching this message today and you're like, man, I want to be part of a move of God. I want to sow seed in a move of God. I want to give back. I want to give that tithe back to God. All right. And it's real easy to do this online. You can just go to loveunlimited.com forward slash give, or you can give using 
Cash App, and it's the dollar sign and the word Love Unlimited. Hey, we had to cancel a few uh, of our events because of the coronavirus pandemic, kind of like having a resurgence here in South Florida, but we are still lining up to do incredible outreach in our city. Uh, this week, we're gonna be partnering with Feeding South Florida and the Hope Foundation. We're gonna be giving out uh, groceries, and so we're still active, we're still moving, we're still producing incredible content, we're preparing to relaunch the church, and we can't do it without your support. So please consider giving a donation today. And now I want to invite you to enjoy this live song by our entire worship band. Okay, enjoy it, love it, like it, check it out. Y el miedo crece, escucharé tu voz Si mi esperanza, mi fe se acaba, mi fuerza tú serás Cuando creo que no hay valor en mí, Dios lo me encuentra en ti No me rendo Sonando como un eco Tu amor me captivó Nunca está lejos Lo siento resonando Como un eco En mi corazón oh, oh, oh. Oh, 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 oh. En cada etapa Tú me recuerdas Tus promesas a mí Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that song. We're gonna share more songs like this with our entire band with you every single week leading up to our grand opening, so make sure you tune in. All right, now I'm gonna ask you to like this video. I'm gonna ask you to leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, and share it because people come to Jesus every week because you share the videos. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.